Good evening. Hello. <laughs> I hope you all had a chance to enjoy the light fair and hors d'oeuvres this evening. We're going to begin the award presentation ceremony. I just wanted to say good evening and thank you for coming to the Royden B. Davis Distinguished Author Award Ceremony here at the University of Scranton. My name is Paula Giangiacomo and I'm honored to be here tonight and serve as our Toastmaster this evening. You may remember me as WNEP's evening anchor, a position I held for 13 years. Currently, I am a freelance reporter for WFMZ TV in Allentown. My career often takes me out of the area, but it is here in northeastern Pennsylvania where my husband Andrew and I uh, live and raise our two sons, Alec and Maddox. The Distinguished Author Award Series began with Friends of the Weinberg Library's desire to recognize and honor the work of fiction and nonfiction authors. The Friends also saw it as an opportunity for authors to share their literary pursuits and impressions with residents of Northeastern Pennsylvania. This year's event coincides with the University of Scranton's 125th anniversary. It was the summer of 1888, Most Reverend William O'Hara, the first bishop of the Diocese of Scranton, blessed a single piece of granite as the cornerstone of the new College of St. Thomas Aquinas. Celebrations will continue all year long here at the university in honor of its 125th anniversary. The honoree of tonight's event is local author and a graduate of the University of Scranton, Dr. Susan Campbell Bartoletti. She is the author of short stories, poetry, picture books, and novels for young readers. Dr. Bartoletti has received some of the most prestigious awards in children's literature. These honors include the Newbery Medal from the American Library Association for Hitler Youth Growing Up in Hitler's Shadow, the Orbis Pictus Award for Nonfiction from the National Council of Teachers of English for Black Potatoes, the Great Irish Famine, 1845 to 1850, and the Golden Kite Award for Nonfiction from the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators for Growing Up in Coal Country. Dr. Bartoletti's most recent book, Down the Rabbit Hole, chronicles the experiences of 14-year-old Pringle Rose who witnesses the Great Chicago Fire in 1871. I read this book myself and from cover to cover, and it is a must read. Dr. Bartoletti will comment on this book a bit later in our ceremony. In 2001, Dr. Bartoletti earned a PhD in English from, the, from Binghamton University, where she won the Excellence in Research Award for her doctoral dissertation. She also earned a master's degree in English from the University of Scranton, as well as a bachelor's degree from Marywood University. Dr. Bartoletti now resides in Moscow, Pennsylvania with her husband, Joseph Bartoletti, and her two grown children are also here in the area, and she also has grandchildren that she babysits one day a week, <laughs> which is probably harder than being an author. <laughs> Now it is my honor to introduce Father Ronald McKinney, Professor of Philosophy here at the University of Scranton. God, our Heavenly Father, on this day of praying for world peace, we thank you for this opportunity to celebrate this wonderful institution of learning, the Memo Weinberg Memorial Library. And we thank you for the presence of our distinguished author who so vividly recreates our local history. May her sophisticated craft continue to teach her young readers and those of us who are old but not yet dead that it is the best characters that are always not black and white stick figures but rich creations, each of them capable of good and evil. But Lord, we ask you to advise our Susan that in her next book, not to kill off too many characters that we grew to love, because there are some readers like our own Betsy Moylan who are too sensitive to read that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so Lord, we bless all those who prepared this wonderful meal for us. Make us mindful of those who are less fortunate. And keep alive in our memories Father Royden Davis, who 
inspired this award, for it was his voracious, eclectic reading of wonderful books that nearly caused the starvation of many an artist because of his penchant for sharing his dog-eared copies with all the rest of us who were too cheap to buy the books themselves. Shame on us. Finally, Lord, inebriate our conversation tonight with the salacious but untrue rumor that Susan's next historical work of fiction is going to be about the exciting origins of a obscure religious college in northeastern Pennsylvania <laughs> 125 years ago. It should be quite the scintillating bestseller on town and gown politics. Amen. Thank you, Father McKinney, for that invocation. Now it is time, I'd like to welcome President Father Kevin Quinn, the president here of the University of Scranton, who has been here with us for a couple of years now. He came to us from California, but he is a native of Long Island, New York, so he has moved closer to home and is enjoying his time here, enjoying the four seasons here in Pennsylvania. Let's welcome President Father Kevin Quinn. Thank you, Paula. And thank you, Ron. I don't know how I can follow after you there. <laughs> Uh, good evening, and let me just add my thanks to all of you for joining us tonight on this very special day for our university. Tonight we welcome back and honor a proud daughter of Northeast Pennsylvania with the Royden B. Davis S.J. Distinguished Author Award. It is fitting that the university has chosen to name this award after Father Davis. He was an active member of this very proud community in the 1990s and early 2000s, as well as a longtime dean of Georgetown College in Washington, DC. Royden was a faithful advocate of the liberal arts and spent his career extolling the virtues of a liberal education. His legacy lives on in those who champion the liberal arts today and in the people who have been honored with his award here at the University of Scranton. So we gather here tonight in thanksgiving for those who celebrate the liberal arts. We honor in a very special way a woman who has given much to the literary world. I am amazed by the, uh, the extraordinary body of work for our honoree, Dr. Susan Campbell Bartoletti. We've already heard this, uh, but let me repeat it. Poetry, short stories, picture books, novels, and nonfiction for young readers. She is a master of many genres. She has been honored more times, as we've heard, than I can count. Susan continues to use the written word to teach our young people. She is a teacher at heart and has dedicated her life to making this world a better place through her work. Our honoree tonight has a, an expansive resume, but I have to acknowledge what I celebrate most about her is that she is a graduate of the University of Scranton. <laughs> and as such, continues the legacy of St. Ignatius and Father Davis by fostering the growth of the liberal arts in the 21st century. So Susan, thank you. And I might add, uh, Susan is a champion of the liberal arts in uncertain times. Your work inspires the entire community in the spirit of Ignatius. You are certainly heeding his call to set the world on fire. Congratulations, Susan, and welcome home. Again, I want to thank you all for coming tonight and supporting the Weinberg Memorial Library and the University of Scranton. God bless you and God bless the University of Scranton. Thank you.
Now I'd like to introduce the Dean of the Weinberg Library and Information Fluency, Mr. Charles Kratz. So welcome everyone. Um, people have been asking me what the boxes are for people who haven't been here before. They're for your cupcakes. Um, <laughs> You know, so you could take all the cupcakes home tonight. Um, I want to thank Paula for being our Toastmaster tonight. I'm delighted. <laughs> and I'm really honored to have all of you here to celebrate our t the 2013 distinguished author, Susan Campbell Bartoletti. You know, for people who were here last year, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Weinberg Memorial Library last year, and it hardly seems like a year has passed. I mean, like life goes by so quickly. But tonight, as, you, if you, as you've already heard from Father Quinn, you know, it's a great honor because we're celebrating the 125th anniversary. So it, it, you know, you're going to hear this from a couple times tonight, but you just need to bear with us. It seems especially fitting that at this time that um, the Royden B. Davis Distinguished Author Award is being presented to one of our own graduates. And it's the first time that that has happened. So Susan, congratulations. <laughs> So on behalf of the University of Scranton and the Friends of the Wine Bar Memorial Library, let me extend a warm welcome to our guest of honor, and you've already, and also to our, our speakers tonight, the president of the University of Scranton, Kevin Quinn, uh, Ron McKinney, who did our um, uh, convo uh, invocation. Um, and I also want to, um, to uh, in, uh, introduce, um, God, I don't have my voice tonight, uh, Dr. Hal Bailey, who you're going to hear from in a little bit, who is our university provost and vice president for academic affairs. And the co-chairs in particular, Phyllis Reinhardt, the co-chairs of tonight's event, and Gretchen Welby, Dr. Gretchen Welby, who are over here at table three and two. So unbelievably to me, um, because I watched last year when we, were, when we were celebrating the 20th anniversary, my life moved over 20 years very quickly. Almost 20 years ago in 1994, the Friends of the Lot Weinberg Library were founded particularly to reach the, the hearts of book lovers and supporters of the libraries in our community. And, and I think that that has been established through the Friends and, and through the, the Distinguished Author Award. And as Paul has already said, it was born out of the library's interest to, to recognize the work of fiction and nonfiction writers, but it also was to recognize achievements in different genres of writing. And so if you look at our past winners in our program, you'll see that you know, the genres of writing have been well represented. But we particularly wanted to also share our literary pursuits and impressions from our authors with our, you know, our community, our academic community, but also our friends in Northeast Pennsylvania. So I, I, if you bear with me, I want to do a couple of thank yous. I mean, first, planning an event like this can't be done without the contributions of many people. You know, I want to first remember Roy Davis, Father Roy Davis. He was the first president um, of the University of Scranton. Um, he has inspired me. You've already heard a little bit about, about, about his background first president of the Friends of the Weinberg Library. Ron McKinney got me right. Um, but, you know, there was something special about him. There was always a twinkle in his eye. There was something very special about him. Um, and he was a lover of libraries. He worked with the Friends of the Library at, at Georgetown University. And he really inspired me. And it was his dream that the Friends of the Library would build an organization that would passionately support the university's library. And it's my honor, you know, for the Friends of the Weinberg Library board and our members to continue to fulfill that dream each year as we move on. So of most important note, I want to recognize our sponsors and how much we appreciate their support. There's the sponsors are in the program. Um, with the one exception, our deans supported the, the program. And they, they were, were not in the program, but I do want to recognize the deans that supported our program. But all the sponsors are listed in the program. We could not do this program without our, our sponsors, and particularly because our students are here tonight, and I see some of them in the back of the room are here because of our sponsors, and I'd like to thank our sponsors. <laughs> My thanks also to an outstanding group of volunteers. They, they're all listed in the program in terms of the planning group for this, but particularly Phyllis Reinhardt and Dr. Gretchen Welby, and the, and the entire planning committee who worked on this. And also special thanks to Ann Moskowitz, who is sitting at table Four here. She's the president of the Friends of the Weinberg Library, and I could not do this. Thank 
I could not do this without this outstanding group of, of, of people who support the library um, each and every day. Um, I want to thank Brian Fesco, who is back in the back of the room, I think, you know, for the work he did on the slides. And also, I want to thank my assistant, Kim Fesco, as always. She did a fantastic job at coordinating the arrangement. So let me bear with me, I'm almost done, but bear with me on a, on a plug, you know, and this is an important plug for 2014 as we're delighted to announce that National Book Award winner Colin McCann will receive the 2014 Distinguished Author Award on Saturday, October 18th. And for people who don't know him, he is an Irish writer of literary fiction. He's a distinguished professor of creative writing in the Master of Fine Arts program at Hunter College in New York City, and he's published in 35 languages. And so his novels include Sundogs, The, the Side of Brightness, um, Dancer, Let the Great World Spin, and his current book, which is on the New York Times bestseller list, is called Transatlantic. I recommend it because I've just finished it. And, but the, he won the National Book Award for the Let the Great World Spin. So October 18th is my plug. So let me just finish by saying, you know, so what, why is this evening important, you know, to the University Library and its friends? And for me, it's really easy to sum it up because it's the critical, what's really critical is the importance for all of us of capturing a story in the written word. So whether you've got a print book, and I must say that as the university librarian here, the dean of libraries, I, you know, the print book is really important to me, you know, and I might be just showing my age there. But for anybody who has the Kindle or the iPad or the tablet in the room, um, it's okay. But you, you know, so you can have it in either, either form, you know. But, what is really important is that, you know, what Susan has accomplished in her stories that empowered the young as well as her novels and nonfiction picture books because it, it nudges, you know, the young readers into history. And I know she's going to talk about that tonight because that's something that was really very important to us. Because I think that, you know, when, you, when she nudges those readers into history, you, they see themselves in its reflection. And I think that, that that's really important. And I want to quote, you know, she was, uh, she had an uh, interview with Booklist, um, Hazel Rockman, and it was in the Contemporary Writers. And there's, in 2012, in the Contemporary Authors, there's a great article about Susan. But what was really impressive to me is what they said, and it was, this was a quote, stories come first for me. I need to look at history in a way that makes sense and one way of making sense is by following story, which is not always about chronology. I choose a character or characters, and she talked about this when we had lunch with her today. And I think that if I develop them honestly and truly, then the, leadership, the readership will follow. But in the end, it's up to the individual reader to decide if I succeeded or not. So Susan, thank you for that special look into your world and for sharing your passion, great passion for writing with us Congratulations from the University of Scranton, from the Friends of the Weinberg Library, and from all of us here tonight. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Phyllis Reinhardt, one of the co-chairs of the Distinguished Author Award event. On behalf of Gretchen and myself, I also would like to welcome you uh, this evening. Each year, the University of Scranton's Friends of the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Memorial Library celebrate the written word and distinguished contributions to literature with the Royden B. Davis Distinguished Author Award event and book selling. The first award was presented in 1997 to actor and poet Jack Palance. Past recipients include Dr. Jay Perini, Steve Barry, Mary Gordon, Philip Margolin, James Grappando, Lisa Scottolini, Linda Fairstein, 
Mary Higgins Clark, Carol Higgins Clark, and Malachi McCourt. Tonight we remember the founding member and the first president of the Friends of the Weinberg Memorial Library, Father Royden Davis, who was an active member of the Friends of the Weinberg Board from 1994 until his death. Father Davis was a re will be remembered for his gentle smile, his warm personality, passion for learning, and devout belief. And tonight we celebrate one of Father Davis's greatest loves, the love of reading and the importance of storytelling and the written word. We are delighted to honor Newbery Honor Award winning author and University of Scranton graduate, Dr. Susan Campbell Bartoletti. With the 19... with the uh, 2013 Royden B. Davis Distinguished Author Award. <coughs> An author of poetry, we've heard this already this evening, I'm merely repeating. An author of poetry, short stories, picture books, novels, and nonfiction for young readers, Dr. Bartoletti has received some of the most prestigious awards in children's literature. These honors include the Newbery Medal from the American Library Association for Hitler Youth, Growing Up in Hitler's Shadow, the Orbis Pictus Award for Nonfiction from the National Council of Teachers of English for Black Potatoes, the Great Irish Famine, 1845 to 1850, and the Golden Kite Award for the nonfiction from the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators who are growing up in coal country. In 2009, she won the Washington Post Washington Children's Book Guild nonfiction award for the body of work. An article in Contemporary Authors states it well. Dr. Bartoletti writes stories that empower the young as well as novels, nonfiction, and picture books that inspire and nudge young readers to look into history and see themselves in its reflection. Often using her native Pennsylvania as the setting for her books, Bartoletti has made a specialty of labor industry specifically tales from the coal mines that make up the underworld of Pennsylvania. Hers are not the usual tales of the coal miner himself or the rapacious coal owners. Rather, Bartoletti focuses on what she terms the gap in history, untold stories of the women and children of the coal mining era. With her nonfiction books, Growing Up in Coal Country and Kids on Strike, she delves into the world of child labor in the anthracite coal industry. In fiction titles such as A Coal Miner's Bride, The Diary of Anetka Kaminska, Barletti relates the hardships and political turmoil of one mining company, com community through the eyes of a young immigrant girl. In her debut picture book, Silver as Night, she tells a fictionalized account of her husband's grandfather who emigrated from Italy and spent nearly half a century in the mines. The versatile Bartoletti has gone further afield for both fiction and nonfiction to the American Civil War for No Man's Land, A Young Soldier's Story, and to Ireland for Black Potatoes, The Story of the Great Irish Famine, 1845 to 1850. I let my instinct tell me whether the story is fiction or nonfiction, picture book or novel. Bartoletti noted on the children's literature website, regardless of the genre, Bartoletti's message remains the same. 
Many books show children as disenfranchised victims. Bartoletti once related in an interview. But this is not the whole story. In the coal mines, in the Civil War, there were many who fought for their rights. They weren't powerless. They did not always need adults to lead the way. And it's important that kids get that message. For their future, they need to see that other kids have power and can be powerful. Born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in 1958, Bartoletti and her family moved several times after the death of her father in 1959. She grew up in the countryside outside of Scranton, Pennsylvania, enjoying the freedom of open land with few urban restrictions placed on her. Two main pastimes ordered her young life. I loved to read and draw as a kid, the author once said. These were my main passions. Dr. Bartoletti's most recent book, Down the Rabbit Hole, is the latest installation in Scholastic's Dear America series. Targeted for middle grade readers, the series introduces history through the diaries of fictional girls living in various eras. Down the Rabbit Hole chronicles the experiences of 14-year-old Pringle Rose who witnesses the great Chicago fire in 1871. In addition to her successful writing career, Dr. Bartoletti has taught students from middle school to graduate school. She has been on the faculty of graduate programs at Pennsylvania State University, University Park, Spalding University, Louisville, Kentucky, and Hollins University, Roanoke, Virginia. She taught courses in creative writing as a distinguished scholar slash artist in Marywood University in 2002, children's and young adult literature as an adjunct faculty member in the Department of English here at the University of Scranton in 1997, 1998, and composition in the Department of English at Keystone College from 1984 to 1986. Dr. Barletti ha also has written several professional articles, co-authored two educational textbooks, and made numerous conference presentations, including keynote addresses. She has served in leadership positions for many regional educational and literary organizations. In 2001, Dr. Bartoletti earned a PhD in English from Binghamton University, Binghamton, New York, where she won the Excellence in Research Award for her doctoral dissertation. She also earned a master's degree in English from the University of Scranton and a bachelor's degree from Marywood University. We would like to ask the provost of the University of Scranton, Dr. Hale Bailey and Dr. Barletti to join us at the podium. Well, let me add my congratulations uh, to an, actually a number of groups. Uh, first of all, it's wonderful to be at the beginning of the year celebration of the 125th anniversary of the institution. Uh, it's, it's humbling to know I've been here for about a third of that. Uh, <laughs> but but it, is, it is actually great to, to be able to uh, uh, look back at that 125 years and look forward to the next 125. Uh, secondly, congratulations to the library. Uh, the, the 20th anniversary of the building of the library is a wonderful event. Uh, the library itself 
uh, has, uh, under the guidance of Dean Kratz, uh, been a, a tremendously uh, forward-thinking institution. Uh, we, we were worried when we were designing the building, uh, and I use the we here uh, uh, advisedly, uh, but with the role of computers and, and how computers would alter uh, what a library is. And, and I think Charles and his team have done an excellent job of uh, both anticipating and meaning, meeting uh, that development. Uh, and now they've been all standing here waiting <laughs> for me to get around uh, to, to the, uh, uh, the reason I'm up here. Uh, uh, and, and I didn't realize everybody was gonna be standing behind me. I had pleaded, I had pleaded with Charles to let me do the invocation uh, because all the good stuff would have been said by the time I got up here. Uh, and, and sure enough, uh, it has. Uh, but I will just uh, very briefly say uh, that what has struck me most uh, about Susan's books have been, uh, and, and this is you know big surprise, I'm a philosopher, the conceptual coherence of those books. Uh, they make enormous sense. There is no writing down uh, to children's literature in, in, in Susan's books. Uh, they, they are challenging. Uh, they are really what, what uh, Nietzsche called monumental history. Uh, history that presents, as, as Phyllis mentioned, models to be emulated, uh, strong uh, uh, young women, uh, Pringle obviously, uh, uh, providing a model uh, for, for all of our children in the 21st century uh, to, to uh, act and grow as mature young uh, folks, young, I, I don't want to say adults because they're not, but, but maturing uh, uh, children, maturing teenagers who are well on their way to leaving, leading a, a, an autonomous, uh, self-fulfilled life, and, and I congratulate her on, on that. Uh, so to get to the formal part, in, in recognition of your remarkable achievements, Susan, the University of Scranton's Friends of the Weinberg Memorial Library honor you with its 2013 Royden B. Davis Distinguished Author Award and citation. The citation reads, quote, the Royden B. Davis Distinguished Author Award presented to Susan Campbell Bartoletti, noted author, I have found my music in a common word from the Je Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins. The citation is dated September 2013 and is signed by Ann Moskovitz, president of the Friends of the Weinberg Memorial Library, and Charles F. Kratz, Jr., dean of the Weinberg Memorial Library. Susan, congratulations from the University of Scranton and all of us here. I don't have to take this on a plane. It's a little pointy for TSA. Wow, thank you. Uh, that was absolutely lovely. Um, I was so blown away when I got the phone call from Betsy Moylan in February. Um, it's such an honor to be here tonight and to be um, given this award you know, by the University of Scranton. Um, tonight, I'm, I'm, I'm so lucky because, you know, I, I look around this room. There are so many people I love here tonight. I see friends. I see family. I see colleagues. I see my former principal. <laughs> I see new friends. I, I just, um, I can't even tell you what this, what this means to me but I'm gonna try and it's gonna take me about 30 minutes. <laughs> I would like to thank uh, members of the Royden B. Davis Award Committee. I've had so much fun these last two days. Uh, dinner last night, 
lunch today, engaging conversations, questions I went home with still answering in my mind, Al. I never had the honor of meeting Father Davis, but I did a little research to find out the sort of man he was. And one of the things that I learned is that, and I don't even think anyone mentioned this here tonight, uh, that the University of Scranton presented him with the Pedro Arupe Award for Ignatian Mission and Ministries. This award recognized Father Davis for the significant contributions he made to the Ignatian Mission. Now this is a Jesuit school and so many of you, if not most, already know something about Ignatius. He was a knight who lived 500 years ago and he joined the Spanish army at 17. In 1521, he fought against the French and was seriously wounded by a cannonball. I guess you might say that the French were the first to canonize Ignatius. <laughs> he was carried back to his family's castle. See why I write for kids, okay? He was carried back to his family castle where he lay bedridden for six months. Now as he recuperated, he read and he reflected about his past and his dreams for the future, and he realized that he wanted more than the riches, the honors, and the fame that he was pursuing on the battlefield. He wanted to devote his life to the service of God and others. So he gave up the life of an aristocrat. He wandered around Europe, studying, teaching, ministering. Among other things, he wrote a book of meditations, prayers, and various spiritual exercises. Eventually, he established an order of like-minded men, which became known as the Jesuits. The Pope later canonized Ignatius as Saint Ignatius of Loyola, the patron saint of all spiritual retreats. Now I'm telling you this little bit of history because I think Ignatius tells us something about the sort of man Royden B. Davis must have been and why I'm so honored to receive this award, award named for him. Now when I consider the life of Ignatius, I see a man who had what some psychologists call a defining moment. Now some of us do need the ton of bricks and for Ignatius, of course, it took a cannonball. Psychologists tell us that we each have these def defining moments in our life, moments that we can point to and say, I am what I am today because of where I was when. Some of these moments are private. They happen when we're alone. Some are personal. They happen in relationships with friends and family. Some are professional. They happen in the workplace. However and wherever they happen, we're told these moments shape us in some way. Like Ignatius, these moments help us become who and what we are today, for better or for worse. And now here's where I argue. If you know me, you're not surprised. I don't think it's the defining moment that shapes us. I think it's the choices we make as a result of that moment. I'll share a uh, professional defining moment. I was so lucky. I landed a position teaching eighth grade as soon as I graduated from college. It seems funny now because I never intended to teach. I was earning a degree in English from Marywood and my husband said to me, well, what are you going to do with that? And I don't know. I thought maybe I'd write. Huh. <laughs> but I got my, edu my, I got my education credits. I did my student teaching and I found out, wow, I really like eighth graders. I know. And if you own one, that's really strange. <laughs> Eighth graders are really cool, you know, because if you don't have a plan, they will. <laughs> you become a very good planner. So my, I spent 18 years in the classroom, and, and during those 18 years, I learned to recognize, I saw the idealism of young people. Oh, I admire their energy and their drive. I see their need to belong and, and their need to seek out role models and heroes. I also see young people who have a very strong sense of justice. They know right and wrong, and they hate the lies that grown-ups sometimes tell them. Eighth grade students, Hal, you're going to like this. They are young philosophers. They enjoy thinking about the big questions in life. They are inquisitive, and they're funny. They find the world a puzzling place, and they don't like it when life isn't fair. 
They want to fix it. That's why you have to have a plan. That's exactly how I feel, and I hope I never get used to the idea that life isn't fair. My students helped me become a writer. You see, each time I gave them homework, I did the same homework. If they wrote a poem, I wrote a poem. If they wrote a story, I wrote a story. If they wrote an essay, I wrote an essay. I did all the literature homework. I did all the grammar homework. They didn't know it. Sometimes, I would, they, would, when they, would, they would always bring their writing into class. We would form these little writing groups. Sometimes, I'd bring my writing into class. And together, we would try to figure out how to make our writing better. Now, I'll tell you, my students, I credit them to this day. They helped me become a writer. That first big discovery, if you want to be a writer, the first big discovery that you have to make, you have to find your voice and your audience. And that's where I found it, there in the classroom, in the hardest job I have ever loved. Who knows? If it weren't for them, I mean, they helped me figure out I want to write for young people. Who knows, if it weren't for them, I might have written something like Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> Wait a minute. Those books have sold millions. There's going to be a movie. Darn those eighth graders. Oh well, it's not too late. In my imagination, Ignatius was excited and eager to begin his journey when he left the castle. That's how I felt when I left the classroom and gave up a full-time job and salary. Here I'm going to quote my mom because whenever I tell her I'm off to do something, she's like, well, have fun. <laughs> and, you know, that's what we, that was just our approach to every new adventure. Now, when I was leaving, I had a daughter in college, and my son was in ninth grade. He was 14, and he took me aside because you know how wise they are. They always have good advice for their parents. And he said to me, because you know, he hoped to go to college, he said, you realize this makes no economic sense, mother. <laughs> you know, he just couldn't understand why someone would spend years writing a book when you could go, just go borrow one from the library for free. <laughs> hmm. Now, I've been quoting Ignatius a lot and drawing on his life and I don't want to give anyone the wrong impression in here because I am not a saint nor do I intend to become one. I'm not into martyrdom. I don't buy into the familiar trope of the suffering artist and I'm not into self-sacrifice either. I can't even stick to a diet. So now, <laughs> if you know me, you also know I'm far too irreverent <coughs> to be canonized. But I do like to think that I can learn something from Ignatius' journey. Because to me, writing is both a spiritual exercise and a philosophical one. Day after day, in story after story, I am seeking the question to an ageless question, seeking the answer to an ageless question how should a human being lead his or her life? Now, one of my favorite quotes from Ignatius is this. We must meet people where they are in the midst of their daily lives. It is there we find God. I like the idea that Ignatius sought and found God in all things. That's where I look for the seeds of story, in the midst of of daily life. That's why so much of my early work has to do with family stories. That's why so much of my early work draws on themes that were important to me as I was growing up. I was lucky to have a dinner table where we discussed big questions. That's where I found inspiration. So tonight I've selected a few snippets from some of my books to share. And uh, the first, I'll begin with just a short reading from Growing Up in Coal Country. Oh, picture. <laughs> the book opens in this way. In Coal Country, the work days began before dawn. A thin, icy blast from the breaker whistle roused sleeping children from the beds they shared 
with their brothers and sisters. They ran downstairs to warm up by the kitchen coal stove. Their mo mother was busy stoking coal, making breakfast, and packing tin lunch pails. Fathers and sons ate quickly, then got ready for work. The men dressed in coveralls and rubber boots. The boys pulled on caps and overcoats and laced up hobnailed boots. They grabbed their lunch pails and headed down the dark streets leading to the mines. So that's, those are the opening paragraphs. And as you've heard in this book, I explore the lives of working children at a time when one out of four mine workers was a boy ages seven to 16 in the anthracite region. Now it's easy for me to see where the seeds of inspiration were sown. Um, of course, first we have to thank my eighth graders because I realized from doing all this research in child labor, two things. First of all, kids from 100 years ago weren't all that different from kids today because rule number one, kids will be kids whenever they can get away with it. My history, my interest in the history of organized labor, of child labor, grew out of the stories that I heard at the dinner table at my husband's grandparents' house. My husband's grandfather emigrated from Italy when he was nine years old. Uh, he and his father and uncles moved to Jessup. And he went to school for a couple of years and then he quit school to get a job in the coal mines. He began work as a boy in the breakers, the breaker building, and then moved underground and he worked for the next 45 years in the mines. Well, as I researched growing up in coal country and then kids on strike, one of the big things I learned was how a growing nation, our nation, was willing to use its children in order to achieve a desired end. In this book, I tell the daily lives of the boys who worked six days a week, minimum of 10 hours a day for negligible wages and no time to go to school, and few or no laws to protect them. But you know, as I said, kids will be kids. What I also found was that work and wages engendered agency in these young boys. And so I also tell the story of breaker boys who played tricks on cruel bosses, who turned out on wildcat strikes if they thought either they as a group or one of their friends was being treated unfairly, or even when they wanted to go swimming, and who banded together to strike for better working conditions against unfair labor practices. And the interesting thing, if the breaker shut down because of a strike, a wildcat strike by the boys, it shut down the rest of the mining industry. The, the whole, and often, not only did the bosses go out to what they do what they called whipping the boys in, because they would take the bull whips with them, um, but the fathers who were working down in the mines would also go out and get to get their sons back to work, because it meant everybody was going to be short on payday. Now, in another book, Black Potatoes, the story of the great Irish famine, I explored the lives of the Irish people who suffered from starvation and related diseases when the potato crop failed. If you lived in Ireland in 1845, you were one of nine million people. At that time, two-thirds of those people, six million, um, either depended completely or largely on one staple food, and that, of course, was the potato. Now, when I tell this to kids in school, um, they feel very sorry for the Irish people, especially when I tell them they didn't have french fries. <laughs> Reason they didn't have french fries? Because they had no ketchup. All right. <laughs> now, what happened then when the potato crop failed is you now have six million people who are without food. And so the story is also about these people, um, as a result of that famine, uh, one million people died from starvation and related diseases, and another two million fled Ireland. And of those two million who fled, 75% ended up here in the United States. Again, I like looking for agency, and these people did not suffer without um, trying extraordinary things to survive. Uh, you found men, women, women, and children who defied landlords and scoured empty fields for edible weeds to eat. The landlords didn't like that. Who walked several miles each day to hard labor jobs and to reach soup kitchens. 
who committed crimes just to be sent to jail where they were assured of a meal. So it's also the story of the courageous Irish people and how they held on to hope during dire times. For me, the big thing that I learned in re from researching and writing about this famine is this conclusion, that famine is not about food. It's about access to food. Because you see, there was food in Ireland. There were wheat crops, barley crops, rye crops. But thanks to an economic environment of laissez-faire, the wealthy landlords continued to export food from Ireland without considering the fate of the poor. Or, because I'm a bit of a cynic at times, I think this is more probable, they did consider the fate of the poor. They didn't want two-legged tenants. They were clearing the land for four-legged ones. Now, when the hungry couldn't pay the rent, the landlords sent agents to evict them. I'm going to read um, part of um, a chapter from Black Potatoes about the day these agents showed up at a woman's house. The woman's name is Bridget O'Donnell. On a cold, damp November day, several rough-looking men rode up to a cluster of small cabins not far from the seaside town of Kilrush, County Clare. Inside one of the cabins, a 30-year-old woman named Bridget O'Donnell lay on a bed of straw. She was seven months pregnant with her fourth child and sick with fever. When Bridget heard the men outside, she knew right away what they wanted, even before they pounded on the door and called out to her to give up the cabin. Quote, Dan Sheedy and five or six men came to tumble my house, said Bridget. They wanted me to give possession, end quote. Stubbornly, Bridget refused to leave her bed, quote, I had a fever and was within two months of my downlying. Now, it didn't matter to the men that Bridget O'Donnell was pregnant and sick. They had orders to follow. When she refused to come out, they battered in the cabin door. One man climbed on the roof, pulled away the thatch, and attached a rope to the main beam. Other men pulled at the rope to bring down the cabin walls. They had half of it knocked down when two neighbors, women, carried me out, said Bridget. Fearing the worst for Bridget and her unborn baby, neighbors carried her into their cabin and sent for the priest who administered last rites. Eight days after the eviction, Bridget gave birth seven weeks prematurely to a stillborn baby. Several days later, her 13-year-old son died from fever. Bridget and her two daughters were admitted to the Kilrush Union Workhouse. Now, that's a true story, and we had an interesting discussion about um, truth in, in nonfiction and my use of quotes. You can't make anything up when you're writing nonfiction. You can't even make up the weather. So when I say it was a cold, damp day in November, you can bet I found the weather from uh, a newspaper. Actually, it was the Illustrated uh, London News and the Pictorial Times where I found the newspaper from 1848. So I knew the weather. Secondly, the quotes. Bridget uh, was interviewed by a reporter for the Illustrated London News in 1849. And so that's how I found her quotes. You can't even make, you can't make anything up. Um, you know, I get so uh, concerned about my characters, these real people, that I find that I hunt them down to see, well, what ended up happening? And I couldn't find Bridget after 1849. Um, I couldn't find her on any workhouse records. I checked the census records from that time period over there, the workhouse records, could not find her. And finally, I, che I checked the um, famine ships uh, their listings, and I found that she, a woman named Bridget O'Donnell and two girls emigrated to America, landing in New York City. Now that explains a lot to me, because you know, um, there's somebody missing in this, and who don't we hear anything about? Like, where's the husband, right? We know he was there at some point, because she's pregnant, and so, <laughs> well, we don't, we don't want to assume, but, um, and so here, you know, what was happening then was a, a lot of men and other family members were emigrating, going to America, finding work, saving up money, sending for the rest of the family. And so what's heartbreaking to me is when he was sending for the rest of the family, did he know Bridget was pregnant? Um, he certainly knew he had a 13-year-old son, and he is met instead by Bridget and two daughters. Um, then I was really hoping that I, I would continue to find out who Bridget was and maybe you discover that she was related to Rosie O'Donnell, then I would have gotten on that show way back then, but that didn't happen. <laughs> now, I like to read aloud 
or not allowed, around. I like to read around. <laughs> uh, one of my former professors called it reading around, and I never know where my interests are going to take me. One day, several years ago, in my reading, I came across an article written in 1944 in which the author claimed that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis in Germany rode to power on the shoulders of politically active youth. Wow, that just made my heart turn right over. And I, that's a good sign because it tells me I'm onto something. And the next thing I did was run to the library to find out if it was true. As I researched, I traced out the lives of young people who lived in Germany and German-occupied territory during those 12 terrible years we call the Third Reich. I tracked down former Hitler youth who now live in Germany. They're, they were in their 70s and 80s and 90s. They lived in Germany, they live in Austria, they live, I found them in Britain, and I found them here in the United States. Some refused to speak to me about their experiences, but some agreed. And so I interviewed them and through telephone conversations and emails and letters and meeting them in their dining rooms and you know, living rooms, I um, learned about their lives. However, I knew that I needed to do something else. For I knew it was impossible and irresponsible of me to try to tell the story of the Hitler Youth without also telling the story of the Jews who were children and teenagers during that time. And so I sought them out as well. Now they were understandably cautious when I first shared the subject of my research, but they agreed to talk with me. Not one refused. I find that interesting. The result of my research in Hitler Youth um, is the story of a generation of young people who numbered nearly 9 million by 1939. This generation devoted its energy and passion to Hitler and thus left an indelible mark on world history. Now a lot of people ask me, and you might be wondering too, how do you find these people to interview? And I'll tell you, I raised teenagers. Believe me, I will hunt you down and I will find you anywhere. <laughs> now, on a speaking tour several years ago, I met a 90-year-old Holocaust survivor named Fred Voss and his wife Ilsa. Together, they lost 64 members of their immediate family, including Ilsa's 12-year-old brother, Kurt, who died in Auschwitz. Fred told me, he's worried. Who's going to tell the story when he's gone after the last of the survivors are gone? I told Fred, it is our obligation, our moral obligation, to continue to tell the story so we never forget what happens when we fail to act. Now, I'm going to share with you and then another selection from a book called The Boy Who Dared. In this selection, you're going to meet a young man who did not fail to act. This story is based on a true story of Helmut Hubener, who at the age of 17 was the youngest person on death row in Nazi Germany. Oh, he was a dangerous political enemy because he was found guilty of writing and distributing pamphlets which criticized Adolf Hitler, the Nazi government, and the war. And they sentenced him to death. Now in this scene, Helmut is eight years old and he cannot sleep because he's thinking about a big question. This book um, is based on a true story, but I want to tell you it is historical fiction. It's historical fiction because I filtered the facts of the story through my imagination in order to tell a complete story because the historical record has some gaps in it. Here's the story. Moonlight floods the bedroom, shimmers the walls, opalescent. It makes Helmut think about God and heaven. Heaven goes on forever, doesn't it? He whispers to his brothers. It's always Gerhard who answers these questions, never Hans, for infinity, says Gerhard, who is nearly four years older than Helmut and knows about heavenly things like planets and stars and suns and moons. Gerhard likes words and numbers precise. Hans, five years older and with little patience for deep discussions, is already asleep or pretending to be. How can something never end, says Helmut? How does it go on and on for infinity? It just does, says Gerhard. That's the way God made the universe, without beginning or end, in all directions. In all directions, repeats Helmut, awestruck. It makes me dizzy, just thinking about it. He stops and thinks about the feeling he has. It isn't dizzy, not exactly. 
I'm floating, he says. Then stop, says Gerhard. I can't stop. I'm going to float away right this minute. Hold on to me, Gerhard. Don't be ridiculous. You're not going to float away. Ridiculous is one of Gerhard's favorite words. I will, too. No, you won't. There's such a thing as gravity. God made that, too, you know. But I am floating, says Helmuth. He rolls toward Gerhard, clutches his arm. Gerhard gives Helmuth the heave, shoves him back toward the center of the bed, and says in a practical voice, when you're old enough to think about infinity, it won't make you float. Now go to sleep. But I like floating, whispers Helmuth, into the shimmering darkness, and he does. It makes him feel drawn to God, as if God is drawing him toward heaven. He doesn't say this to Gerhard because he doesn't want the feeling to disappear. Besides, he knows that Gerhard has stopped listening. That's the way Gerhard is, so able to remain anchored in the world. And so Helmuth keeps floating toward heaven until he falls fast asleep. One thing I've learned about from the research and writing of Hitler Youth and the Boy Who Dared is this. It's easy to look at the history of a country like Germany and say, look what happened there, look what they did. It's much harder to turn inward and look at ourselves and our own history and consider the times when our actions didn't honor our words or the words of our Constitution. And that's why I wrote my latest nonfiction book, they called themselves the KKK, about a paramilitary group dedicated to using psychological and physical terror in order to maintain and restore white supremacy throughout the South. It's ironic to me that when I travel throughout the South, I see these countless memorials to Confederate leaders, but yet not one memorial stands for the tens of thousands of victims of Klan violence that took place during that first wave of the KKK, during its beginnings. Now, life, I find, is relentlessly ironic. Learning that about life can be painful. But you should know, irony is the writer's friend. For out of irony, stories grow. In the next book, and the main reason we're here tonight. Um, I'm going to share a few short selections from Down the Rabbit Hole. Now this book opens, as you've been told, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. I've lived in the Scranton area nearly all my life, and so I try to sneak Scranton in to um, anything I am writing. The year is 1871, and the main character, 14-year-old Pringle Rose, has learned that her parents have been killed in a terrible accident. Shortly afterward, her uncle and his wife became their guardians. When life becomes unbearable, Pringle and her 10-year-old brother Gideon run away to Chicago, where they hope to live with their mother's best friend. They arrive in Chicago in September, one month before the Great Fire begins. And as the book's title suggests, Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland plays a role in the story. Um, I'll tell you that it's an epistolary novel. It is told in diary form. I'll begin uh, with one entry the f when they get on the train. They're on the train. At 9 a.m. sharp this morning, the train whistled and snorted a great puff of smoke. Gideon clapped his hands over his ears and grinned at me. He loves whistles and bells. I forced a smile. To settle my stomach, I concentrated on our journey. With each chuff of the mighty engine, Scranton slid further into the distance, and the hard knot loosened in my stomach. Soon the steady rhythm comforted me. I told myself that the train was galloping Gideon and me towards safety and a new life. I squeezed Gideon's hand and turned my head so he wouldn't see the hot, salty tears streaming down my face. Dear sweet Gideon, he always senses when something is wrong, and because he's a gentleman, he tries to fix it. He took out his white handkerchief and offered it to me. I dabbed my eyes and cheeks and chin. Nothing but a cinder, I told him. All better, see? He folded the handkerchief four times into a neat square and tucked it into his shirt pocket. From his vest pocket, Gideon took out his gold pocket watch, a gift from father when Gideon learned to tell time. He pressed the clasp, springing open the lid. I settled back into the car's plush velvet seat and let my thoughts fly forward. We'll reach Chicago on Wednesday morning, I told him. 
Gideon moved his fingers and held up three. That's right, I said. Three days. You count very well. Gideon leaned against me. He smelled like spice and bergamot and orange blossoms. Are you wearing father's cologne, I asked him. He nodded. Now in this next entry, Pringle and Gideon, um, this is actually going, skipping back in time. I was playing with time in this book. I wanted to see if I could tell a story coherently in a fractured time form. And so this is when um, they bought their tickets. I hung our tickets in the slot above our seat and let Gideon sit by the window. Before long, he tr the train hissed and snorted his great breath. The conductor called out, all aboard. At the very last moment, a harried looking woman with three young children in tow climbed aboard and filled the seat behind us. As the train pulled away from the station, Gideon's carpet bag swelled and growled. I gasped, you didn't. I unsnapped his carpet bag and oh my paws and whiskers, a white paw shot out and swiped at the air. Gideon grinned, oh you, what are we gonna do with Mosey? I pretended to be annoyed, but secretly, I was happy that Mosey was safe with us because he didn't have many lives left. Besides, Alice's cat Dinah never did get to Wonderland, did she? Now Mosey sleeps in the carpet bag at our feet and the train puffs north like a great racehorse through the prettiest oaks and maples and pines. Little girl behind me keeps kicking my seat. She makes my teeth rattle. Next entry. We've been underway for an hour. Gideon stares out the window as if he hopes train robbers will burst out. Behind us, a red-haired boy with a freckled face stuck his right arm straight out and pointed his fingers like a rifle. Pow, he said. Then he wheeled his arm around and pointed his finger at Gideon. Pow, pow, pow. The boy ducked. He poked his head over the seat. Got you. Adam, said his mother, you mustn't pester. Adam's mother looks tired, no doubt, from three children. Beside her sits a small girl with large brown eyes and cupid face and feet that use my seat for a drum. On the, her lap, the mother holds a smaller, chubby baby girl who doesn't talk but points and says, ah, ah, ah. I want Chil Gideon to stick up for himself. I lifted his arm and folded down his thumb and three fingers and aimed his pointy finger back at the boy. Pow, I whispered, say it, pow. Gideon wiggled free, but his face glowed with keen interest and wistfulness. He longs to play. He longs for a true friend. A true friend is worth waiting for. Someday Gideon will find a true friend. It's just a matter of time. I know it. Just as I know, a new life awaits in Chicago. Now readers often ask me if I have a favorite book that I've written, and I do not. But I do have favorite characters. And in this book, Gideon is one of my favorite characters. And I'll share with you his, that this, that his character was inspired by a family friend named Sal Angelo, who was born with Down syndrome in 1947. I first met Sal when I was 16. Little did I know, as I grew to know Sal and his amazing family better, that over those years I was collecting seeds for a character named Gideon. Now you can read more about Sal and his extraordinary life in the author's note to that book. I'll tell you this, he died two years ago at the age of 62. Now tonight, I'd like to acknowledge that Sal's sister, Rosemary Crotty, is here tonight, and I know I'm going to embarrass her, but I want to say thank you, Rose, for the help that you gave me And right, where are you? I know you have a beautiful dress on. There you are, okay. Would you stand up? I want people to know who you are. <laughs> I was so nervous, I, I, I printed out the manuscript and Rose and I met at um, Cooper's for lunch and I, will you please read this? And she gave me, I think, the finest compliment ever on the book because she thought that I truly captured Sal's unique personality and his gifts in the story. Um, but I want to thank you for your help um, that you gave me in those conversations and, and for all that you do as an advocate for children with special needs. Now I'm going to conclude tonight by reading a bedtime story. It's a lullaby written in a Middle Eastern poetic form called a guzzle. 
It's not a pure guzzle because I've Americanized the form just as many Western poets have done. Um, before I read it, uh, you may um, have often wondered what was Noah's wife's name, and haven't you wondered that? And you know, it always felt unfair to me because I know she did a lot of work on that ark and her name. So there is a biblical scholar by the name of Frances Utley um, who once did some research and found that she has been given 103 different names. Um, out of those names, my favorite name is the name Naama, uh, which means great singer. And um, it's a name that shows up in the Torah. And so that's the name I've chosen for her. And once I found out her name and knew what her name meant, it helped me write the story. Um, you know, I think of the gifts that we give our children, and one of them is a name. And our, our name, the names that we choose for our children often express our wishes, our prayers for our children as well. Um, I have a thing about Noah's Ark. Um, I have a very old Noah's Ark that belonged to my father, and you heard earlier that um, he died when I was a baby. Uh, but I used to play with that ark at my grandmother's house, and now that it's at my house, I just dust it. <laughs> but um, it helps me imagine, you know, that's where my imagination would go. I've been so lucky in my life because, um, you know, I had two fathers. My mom remarried, and I got a, another dad. Uh, my first grandchildren were born the very same year that this book was published, and they are twins, boy, girl. And uh, so it's a, it's a book that means a lot to me, and the illustrations are amazing. They were done by Holly Mead, who... Um, passed away from cancer this past summer. So, now don't fall asleep, it is a lullaby. Okay. As rain falls over the ark at night, as water swirls in the dark of night, as thunder crashes the seams of night, as Noah tosses in dreams of night, as restless animals prowl at night, as they pace and roar and growl at night, Naama sings all through the night. She sings and strokes their hair at night. She sings a bedtime prayer at night. She sings for moon to fill the night. She sings for stars to thrill the night. She sings for earth and sky at night, soothes her sons and their wives at night. Naama sings all through the night. Over the ark, song flows at night. Two by two, eyes close at night. Two by two, wings furl at night. Two by two, tails curl at night. Two by two, the beasts of night are lullabied to sleep at night. Naama sings all through the night. Beneath the clouds that shroud the night, the ark sails long into the night, cradled by the song of night. Hush, hush, hush. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope you can um, see the answers that I have found to that age-old question, how should a human being lead her life? I think we can look to Naama for an example. I'll tell you in closing, she is my kind of woman. Sure, she must have felt longing and loss and perhaps even worry for the future. She had that defining moment, that moment, you know, she's on the ark. Um, but in my imagination, um, that voyage uh, was a spiritual exercise for her. She didn't fight or flee, or freeze. In my imagination, she moved, just as Ignatius did. That's what I intend to do. Thank you.